Give you strength to carry on. Make your muscles big and strong. If you find yourself in need, why don't you listen to these words of ease? Why don't you listen? Do you like Earth, Wind, and Fire? Anybody remember Earth, Wind, and Fire? Everybody my age will remember them. That's one band I never got to see and I would have loved to have seen. Maurice White was the leader of Earth, Wind, and Fire. They're out of Chicago. And uh, Philip Bailey was uh, also the lead. He was the guy that sang the high parts. And Maurice White, you know, he was the guy that go, yow, you know. He had the low parts. Well, Philip Bailey um, um, got saved, gave his life to Jesus, and and uh, um, did a bunch of fantastic gospel albums, and did some collaborations with Phil Collins as well. And uh, anyway, why am I telling you that? Oh, probably because I downloaded a a, a a live version of uh, my favorite Earth, Wind, and Fire tune. Which of course is shining star for you to see what your life could truly be. That's the you know that's the best part of the Doctor Strange movie. Have you seen Doctor Strange? Okay, the first one. The best part is when he's getting ready to operate and and they play Shining Star. I'll tell you, if this is just so spiritual. Oh, we're off to a just a glorious, holy and sanctified start here tonight. Well, because it's not nine o'clock, eh? Like I don't, I don't really consider us starting the show until nine o'clock. So while I'm getting ready with you know our our, our low tech setup here, um, um, I've actually been told that, that that people that watch Ask the Pastor um, during the week or they tune into our live um, church broadcast, which you know again about ninety to ninety five percent of the people that watch that watch it later. They don't watch it live. But I've, I've been told they love the spontaneity and the un unexpected quality of it. And you know what? I like that too. Like everything you see, almost everything you see connected with church or the gospel is so pre-programmed, rehearsed, and, you know, God, everything's got to be so right. I, I don't know. Real life's not like that, you know? And and uh, uh, at Christ Church, we lo we love it when mistakes take place, you know, because you know we we don't worship church, we don't worship the service, we worship Jesus, and and uh, you know we come to Jesus as we are, and when we do church and we sing and we preach and we share and we crazy stupid things happen, and and you think about some of your greatest memories of your family times, it's when things happen that you didn't think were going to happen. Life is not pre-rehearsed. Life is not perfect. You know, you may have a comment about that. You may want to ask a question about that. It's Ask the Pastor Night tonight. I have got, oh, hundreds of questions that will carry this show right through to the summertime, thanks to Kirk, our show producer. And uh, But Kirk and I both feel it's right before God that whatever comes on the comment section that gets our full attention. That takes precedent over anything that we've got, you know, ready to go as far as, you know, uh, uh, um, and, and comments can be about anything. I mean, when I did, did Ask the Pastor Live as a phone-in show, you know, it was open line, open topic, whatever you want to talk about. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to approach everything that comes on the comment section from hopefully a biblical perspective. And if I can't give you a biblical perspective on it, I'll, I'll do my best to, you know, come as close as I can, okay? Because that's the, to me, that's the uniqueness and that's the strength of the show. The strength is not the wit and wisdom of John Council. The strength is the power of the Word of God and how relevant it is. It is so relevant to everything we do in life that you can go open line, open topic. It has something to say about almost everything, everything in life. 
And uh, maybe that's a bit of a challenge for you. But if you want to participate live, you can't do this when you're watching it later in the week. But if it's if it's around between 9 and 10 Eastern Time, Tuesday night, man, go for it. And uh, I always, in my opinion, it makes the show that much better if we've got interaction in the comment section. So let's uh, let's see what happens, okay? Let's pray first. Father, thank you for this great opportunity I have, God. It's low tech, Lord. There's hardly anybody ever watching live, but I don't know, God. It's just fun. And I think, God, your word is true. Your word says wherever the Spirit of God is, where the Spirit of God is, there is fun. And, Lord, we have proven that so many times. So, Lord, uh, you're in charge. Um, you promised that your word would not go forth and it would not return back to you empty. So we, we know, God, that when your word gets shared, it does things. It's alive. And it comes alive in people's lives, and it does wonderful things. Lord, let the power of your word be loosed in every way possible tonight, Lord, as we share and as we uh, yak tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you ready to go? Here we go. Uh, from our esteemed uh, show producer and uh, um, um, content provider, the mighty Kirk Tomerlin, the newly married Turk Kirk Tomerlin. He's so happy all the time since he's got married. He can't walk the smile out of his face. Take the smile off his face. He married just a wonderful girl named Rowena, and, and we're just still getting to know her. She, oh, she is just, man, so happy for him. So happy for him. And uh, just, it's just good to see a guy just, you know, being the center of God's will and being blessed. And I, I just love working with him. Anyway, Genesis 44, 27 to 34. Long passage. Judah told Joseph, if Benjamin didn't return to his father, that's Jacob, okay, whose name was changed to Israel. His father would die. Was this hyperbole? Or do you know there's people that actually pronounce the word hyperbole, hyperbole? <laughs> Unbelievable. Anyway, was this hyperbole? Or would Jacob literally die from a broken heart? Um, I think that was an honest evaluation of Judah's part. I really do. I think that that if something would have happened to Benjamin, um, uh, the rest of the brothers knew um, how much Jacob favored Joseph and Benjamin. And the brothers knew that when Jacob lost Joseph and thought that he was dead, they saw the impact it had on him. And I think that I think that his brothers, Judah and, and uh, you know Reuben, Naphtali, Dan, Asher, the whole crew of them there, um, I think they they were probably very sorry for what they did when they saw the impact it had on their father. And um, um, I, I think that Judah was being honest there. I don't think that was hyperbole. I think that Judah really loved his dad, and uh, they were very protective of Benjamin. They weren't hard on Benjamin like they were on Joseph, although Joseph was somewhat pretentious when he had his dreams, you know, and he kept insisting, and, and I think... Um, and Joseph probably had a way about him that rubbed his brothers the wrong way. And uh, But when they did what they did to him, I think they were truly sorry. I think they were, uh, um, you know, they, they never told their father the truth, you know, or there's no biblical record that they did. And um, I think they, they probably had the attitude of, no, we're not going to be that way with Benjamin. We, we don't want to see our father suffer like that. So I, I don't think that was hyperbole. I, I think that Judah was giving an honest evaluation as he saw it. And he was not, uh, he was not, I think he was being honest and transparent there. Um, what do I base that on? That There's not, a, there's not, I've never seen that question before. So I've never um, seen that question addressed in any commentaries or anything on that. So it's, it's just I, from, you know, from my own uh, uh, familiarity with the story and human nature. So that it's, it's opinion. But if anybody else has got another opinion, I'd, I'd love to hear what they have to think. And, and if they want to justify it, that'd be a, a, good, a good discussion. Next question. How much time did it take to travel between Canaan to Egypt during the days of Jacob? I've read anywhere between 11 days and three weeks. Um, that's a little long. You know, I think it could be done um, probably... You know, with, with adequate uh, 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 food and everything, it, it, it maybe seven days to two weeks. Although 11 days or three, that's not too far out. That's not too far out. I think it could be done a little bit quicker. Now, of course, that's the same route. Like, you know, people say, you know, it took uh, uh, Israel 40 years to get from Canaan to Egypt. Yeah, because they were wandering in, in the desert and 
you know, uh, God was not ready to uh, uh, go with them, you know, because he, he rebuked them. I just was reading that in the Bible this week, you know, of how, you know, they uh, were ready to go in there and they doubted and uh, God had to kill off a whole generation before, you know, they were worthy to go in there, which is quite a story. Um, but physically, yeah, it only takes like maybe two to three weeks to uh, to go there. Um, good question. Describe timelessness in eternity. I can't. I've never been there. <laughs> any any answer to that question would be so speculative. And, uh, you know, I, I don't mind being speculative to, to try and answer the question. Describe timelessness in eternity. Um, you know what? I think that a lot of New Age and science fiction thought has crept in to a lot of our um, interpretation of how of concepts that are in the Bible, and eternity being one of them. Um, the only thing we know about eternity is it's a long time, it's without end, it's without beginning, um, and the word says that like one day is like a thousand years to us, to God, and, and so it gives you a bit of a glimpse, but it does not go into detail. Um, and, you know, C.S. Lewis and, and a number of other writers, you know, and I don't think they're wrong. I don't think it's wrong with, you know, respective speculation. But I think that timelessness and eternity, I think it's way more practical and way more real than uh, um, um, than we think it is. Okay? I, I think it's, uh, I don't think it's as out there. And I don't think it's as uh, uh, crazy as, as some people have speculated. Um, one thing you learn as you grow in your relationship to God, as you understand the Bible and you understand the way he does things, he's, he's incredibly practical. He's incredibly thoughtful. And there's a reason for just about everything in the Bible. I love, uh, and I refer so often to Michael Heiser, um, cause, uh, Michael Heiser's probably had more influence on me in the last year and a half than any um, Christian leader I can think of. And, uh, I love one of his lines. He says, when I'm reading the Bible and, and, and I come across a verse that, that seems weird to me, uh, uh, right away I, I, I think, okay, um, I need to find out what's going on here. And, and he feels attracted to you know, uh, studying it and getting the meaning of it. And, and sure enough, every time he finds a verse that it seems weird to him, there's layers and layers of truth and undiscovered truth that is just, you know, that he's, you know, uh, discovered and he's shared with all of us. So that's one of the reasons why I love his teaching. And I think, uh, I think that the, our concepts of eternity, uh, I think eternity is, is not as far out as people think it is. Okay. I think it's no more than what the Bible says it is and no less. Okay. And uh, maybe a good way to describe it is the older you get, time kind of shrinks, you know, Christmas, I'm 63. Christmas gets here a lot quicker than it used to. Summer vacations are a lot shorter than they used to. Uh, days are shorter. Why? Because I'm older. My little four-year-old granddaughter, Ellie, um, you know, like, well, you're not going to see mommy and daddy for three days. Oh, my goodness, that's an eternity to her. She's only four years old. She's got a much, much, like, tinier frame of reference. So if God is eternal... Well, you can see why a day would be like a, 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 a thousand years to us, you know, because he's lived a lot longer. And uh, I have a good friend, uh, one of my best friends. He was one of our elders, uh, uh, Don uh, McDougall. I love Don. Uh, he was just such a wonderful man of God. And he, and he went way too early. I think he was 72 years old. And I remember, uh, you know, visiting him when he was in ICU and one of his uh, on his last days. And I remember him saying a couple times, he says, life is so short. Life is so short. And, and, and that was coming from somebody that just loved God. And, um, but maybe he was sobered by, you know, make the most of every opportunity. And, uh, and even the Bible says that. It says the Ephesians, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And uh, redeem the time. So a bit of a discussion came out of that question, Kirk. So again, great question. Um, did my best. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 15. Please describe and explain these two verses. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all 
and those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Um, describe and explain, okay, um, I think uh, uh, he's illustrating and, and giving light to the miraculous nature of the light of, of the life of Christ and uh, his love for us while we were yet sinners and undeserving of anything that he did for us has provided eternal life for us. And he did it out of a heart of love. And um, uh, man, uh, that should compel us to follow him. It should. If you can really get a grip on the love of God, if you can really get a grip on on uh, what He's provided for us, boy, if that doesn't compel you to love Him, uh, you are made out of stone, or uh, you are uh, the product of what Second Corinthians four four says. It says the God of this world has blinded the non-believer so that they cannot see the glorious light of the gospel. People can't see the glorious light of the gospel because we have a, a, a spiritual enemy that has blinded people to it. And uh, prayer destroys that blindness. And that's why those of you that, that love God, you need to understand how important, how powerful prayer is. Some of your loved ones that you can't figure out why they can't discover Christ, why they can't see Christ, there's spiritual blindness there. And the only way that's going to go away is through prayer. And through, you know, trusting God and asking God to show you, okay, God, how do we pray this out? That's what the purpose, one of the greatest purposes of prayer is, is to get God's will done. And he's not willing that any should perish. Okay. And uh, he puts a lot of that responsibility on us to, you know, to, to pray without ceasing and to, and to you know, to, 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 to spread the gospel and to tell people that, you know, they don't have to be doomed. Like there's, there's a way of salvation. Second Corinthians 519, please explain what the message of reconciliation is God, here's the verse, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting, okay, I don't know if he's quoting it here or not, okay, well, just let me read it as it is. God was recounting, reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us, okay, that's the quote, 2 Corinthians 5.19. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, as he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Okay, so what does that mean? What does that go? What's going on there? Um, the death and resurrection of Christ is how God has reconciled what was lost. The only way that what was lost through the Garden of Eden and the sin of man was for innocent life to pay the price for that sin. And that those who have sinned and those who live in that sin if they put their faith and their confidence on what has been paid for them, they will be saved, okay? The death and the resurrection of Christ is how God has reconciled what was lost when man rebelled in the Garden of Eden, okay? And subsequent rebellions. The rebellion against God at the Tower of Babel, okay? The rebellion against God by his uh, by His ruling council, the Nephilim, okay? He came down and rebelled against God. Well, there's been a number of rebellions, and that has been reconciled salvation for that has been has been made through Christ okay and uh, um, but it can't be forced on us we must desire it okay and and it's been made available free of charge to us okay describe God's wealth what could his wealth ever be I don't think you can describe the wealth of God he's all-powerful he owns everything. He's control of everything. I don't think God even thinks about wealth because he is the creator of all things. All blessing comes from him. And if anything's good, it comes from God, okay? And uh, there's no limit to it. So here's a finite being sitting in an office, you know, doing a low-tech broadcast, answering questions about the Bible. There's no way I could, I could, I could adequately describe the power and the wealth of God, okay? He's everything. And he's my dad. Good enough for me. Not a good answer? Hey, I don't even think it's a good answer, but I don't think anybody could give a good answer. And if they could, I, I'd love to hear it. Psalm 103, 11, 17, and 18. God's love of mankind is great, but his love for those who fear him is greater. 
Tell us why this is so. Okay, now look at the statement Kirk's making here, okay? Need to get this. God's love of mankind is great. Okay, well, it's actually incredible. It's unsearchable. It's without limit. He died for those of us you know, before, while we were yet sinners. He, he loved us enough to die for us. So his love is great. But, and Kirk says this, his love for those that fear him is greater. Okay, so he's making a statement there. Do you agree with it or not? I understand what he's saying. I do agree with that. Uh, I need to define, and, 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 and I can't just, I can't go around saying, you know, like you've heard the term, well, put the fear of God in those people. Those people don't have the fear of God. You know, the fear of God is to, is to hate evil. And we hear a lot, especially in the Old Testament, about the fear of God. And uh, people get a misinterpretation of it. They think, well, why would I be afraid of God? I thought he's my father. He's my friend. I want to trust my father. I want to, how can I love somebody that I fear? And uh, I need to um, um, define what that fear of God means. Uh, the, the, the Greek word, uh, the Hebrew word that's used for fear is not the same of cringing, we're afraid fear. And I always use my, my favorite uh, uh, illustration is uh, I have a good, healthy fear of my chainsaw. I love my chainsaw. I love it when I pull that cord and that thing's just ripping through anything. It is just a feeling of power. I love it. It's, it just, it's wonderful. But I've got a healthy fear of that thing as well. You don't mess with that thing because it can kill you. One little false step and 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 the right wrong and it hits the right place in your body, you're dead. Okay, so I got a good healthy fear. I enjoy it. It's a great tool, but I got a good healthy fear of it. And God is awesome. God is fantastic, but I got a good healthy fear of Him. Okay, I respect Him. It's more respect than fear. It's it's a respect that is so high it kind of crosses over into. Well, the word awful, the word awful used to mean filled with awe, okay? And um, um, to inspire awe is to be full of awe, awful. Sounds like it's bad. Well, fear is the same thing where uh, this type of fear, you, you are just so filled with awe and, and, and reverence that you go, oh, that's God. He's, that's the type of fear that he wants us to have. So Kirk says, um, but love for those, God has more love for those who fear him greater. And I agree with him. Just like a parent, like I love my kids. My love for my kids is, is unconditional, okay? But the ones, and especially when they were younger, the ones that obeyed me got more privileges. The ones that obeyed me, I was able to have more affinity with them. I was able to have more open, heartfelt discussions with them. Um, my brother... Um, uh, Richard is, uh, you know, Richard came to Jesus about, oh, 12, 13 years ago. Well, for in, his entire life, um, like uh, our dad died when I was 29 and Richard would have been about 32. So like, um, the whole time my dad was alive, Richard never served God. And, and he really, you know, resented the fact that his dad was a pastor and, and, uh, and, uh, um, um, you know, I got to spend far more intimate times with my dad than Richard ever did because Richard was very openly rebellious to my dad to the point that when I was a little kid, I saw him breaking my dad's heart and I thought, man, I, I don't want to do that to my dad. And and uh, it had a positive effect on him. Now, I know for a fact that my dad loved Richard just as much as he loved me, okay? But Richard never got to enjoy uh, my dad's love, you know? And um, there's no question my dad would have been more, more pleased, but he wouldn't have been any less loving to, you know, his son that was like living in open rebellion. And God's like that too. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. It wasn't any works that caused me to, to uh, um, earn more favor from God. But because we're obedient to him and because we do what he wants, we tend to get more out of him. Okay. Our relationship is as God intended it to be. And uh, does that mean he loves us more? I don't think maybe he loves us more, but we get to experience his love more. And he gets to share his love with us more. He would love to share it with people that don't want anything to do with him, but they don't want to have anything to do with him. So I don't know if he, if he loves us more. It's just that he gets to share it more and experience it more. Again, and Kurt, terrific question. Is Sheol another word for hell? Or is this another word for the abyss? What is Sheol? Well, Sheol, the Greek word, is Hades. That's the place of the dead. Hell 
Uh, the Greek word, uh, hell, is there's no equivalent in the Old Testament. It's more of a New Testament uh, uh, um, word. And, and the Greek word for hell in, in the New Testament is uh, Gehenna. And there's no Hebrew Old Testament translation for Gehenna. Gehenna is the lake of fire. It's, it says that in the book of Revelation that Hades and death were thrown into Gehenna. It is the eternal lake of fire, hell. Now, Hades, which is the present hell, Sheol, same thing. It's darkness. It's a place of, uh, of separation from God. Um, Jesus describes it in Luke uh, 16, which uh, there are some people that read it and say, well, he's telling a parable. I don't agree with that. I believe it was real. I, and because he uses real names, Lazarus, he uses a certain rich man. The Greek word, when it says certain, does not say uh, it, it means a, a certain specific and alive you know, rich man. Okay. And I think we get a bit of a glimpse because there was flame there. There was torment. There was pain. Okay? So Sheol and Hades, the same. Now, it's quite possible because you don't hear much about the flames and the torment of Sheol in the Old Testament. But it's quite possible that there are different degrees of punishment and there are different compartments of Hades. It's possible there are parts of Hades where there's not as much flame. It's just darkness and gloominess and separation and a place of, you know, uh, um, just less unpleasant than the pain aspect of it. Gehenna is different, though. Gehenna is all the lake of fire. It is eternal, and it's it's not nice. Okay, so Sheol, Hades, same thing, from what I see and what I can see in Scripture. Is truth always its own best defense? Hmm. No. I don't think it is. I think love is its best defense, okay? Because the Bible says speak the truth in love, because if you speak the truth and it's not in love, it's probably not going to have as much impact. Love is what gives the truth more power. And I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians 13 where it says, if I can fathom all mysteries, in other words, not only do I know the truth, I can understand the truth. And if I can speak eloquently of them and I don't have love, it's useless. So there's a case of the truth not being its best defense. Love is the best defense. I mean, the truth is a great thing, you know, but love is even more powerful. And I know those those are, that sounds a little abstract, but I just gave you an illustration of being able to speak the truth and there, there's no love there. Love is more important. In fact, I would suggest that 1 Corinthians 13 teaches that um, love um, can be pretty meaningless. I mean, uh, truth can be pretty meaningless without love. You know, can have no impact whatsoever without love. Hmm. When did Judah become Judea? Um, it doesn't say specifically anywhere in the Bible. But it seems as though Judah, which, you know, was the name of one of the uh, sons of Israel, and it was one of a region, they all were allotted regions, and Judah was more in the south of uh, Israel, as connected right next to the territory allotted to Benjamin as well. And uh, uh, it probably started switching from Judah to Judea uh, when the kingdom split under Rehoboam. Rehoboam was Solomon's son. Jeroboam became the king of Israel in the north that later, you know, was known as Samaria. And uh, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, you know, the kingdom was split and, and Rehoboam ruled over Judah where Jerusalem was and Bethlehem and, and uh, much smaller territory. And it was probably, they started probably calling it Judea or Judea, I believe, the real meaning means the land of Judah, okay? So, uh, and Judea eventually incorporated Benjamin into it as, uh, you know, uh, that territory there. So, uh, that's a long time. From Solomon until Jesus' time, that's that's a good, oh man, thousand years or so. And uh, so it was a long progression, but it would definitely be after um, after the kingdom split. That really narrows it down, eh? A thousand years? <laughs> uh, in the Gospel of John, the author, John, never mentions his own name. 
but refers to himself as the apostle whom Jesus loved. Was this an act of humility or something else? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. Because for him to refer to himself as the apostle that Jesus loved, uh, yeah, that doesn't sound too humble at all. Okay. Um, he's trying to remind people, you know, I'm special. You know, I'm the guy that he loved. I'm the guy that, you know, really had the inside information. And John is a far, far more intimate portrayal of the life of Christ than the other three Gospels. The other three Gospels are called the Synoptic Gospels. In other words, they're a synopsis of what happened in the time of Christ. And John's Gospel is much more inside, okay? Like, for instance, John 17, you know, you get a record of what Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's not in the other Gospels because it's almost as if John was right there listening. He had much closer to Jesus, and Jesus confided in him more than any other. Jesus, and most scholars and commentators, uh, say, you know, uh, portray John as being kind of like Jesus' little brother more than anything. He kind of protected John. John was the, the youngest. And John, probably being the youngest, probably was the most idealistic as well. Although James and John, the two brothers, Jesus nicknamed them the sons of thunder, which, you know, means that, you know, well, James was much more, you know, he was much more of a big mouth than John was. Uh, James, is, John's brother, was the first martyr, you know. Let's get the big mouth first, you know, and he was the first disciple to get beheaded. And um, um, I don't, I, what that something else is, that's, that, that's a good discussion. You know, like, uh, I don't know. That's a great, great question, Kirk. Um, and I'm only speculating here. I, I, When a guy refers to himself as the apostle of Jesus loved, I don't know. There's To me, that's, I know it's the word of God. And I know he's inspired, you know, by God. But why that's there, I'd like to know, too. I'd give me my thoughts, but, you know. There's nobody else on this broadcast to share their thoughts with me. So, and if somebody wants to add to the comments, you know, feel free to, you know. We know every sin must be punished either by the eternal flames of hell or in the back of the crucified body of Jesus. Is there a third option available to us? Nope. There is no other option. And if there is, I want to see scripture and verse, please. And uh, I, I, you know, people can speculate all you want, but it's mere speculation. There is no scriptural support for any other option. Our sin is either dealt with on the cross or it is punished by hell. It's pretty sobering. Has there ever been a more painful form of execution than crucifixion? Absolutely, yes. And I don't want to go into the gory details, but um, I will recommend a book to you. And you may have heard of Fox's Book of Martyrs. Fox's Book of Martyrs is a historical account of oh, the biggest account of martyrdom for Christ that's ever been written in church history. Okay, I've never been able to finish it. It's too gory for me. Okay, It is brutal. And a lot of things they did to Christians was worse than the cross. I mean, I, mean, I don't think it's a healthy thing. And I base it on the scripture, whatsoever things are good report, whatsoever things are wholesome, whatsoever things are honest and praiseworthy, think on those things. Um, I think you can go down a road of, of uh, darkness that you know, could really soil your soul. You want to go into methods of torture, there's all, there's, yeah, you go into Nazi Germany, communist Russia, communist China, uh, Pol Pot, and uh, um uh, in uh, Vietnam, the killing fields of Cambodia. There's, yeah, there's more horrible ways to die than crucifixion. Okay, leave it at that. Please explain why, when none of us are worthy to atone for our own sins, well, because we all sin. We're imperfect. Okay, Jesus never sinned. His uh, his his blood, his sacrifice for. And remember, God is the one who set the um, rules down. He's the one that said, look, this is the way life works. This is the way sin works. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And he created us with blood, and life is in the blood. Blood is a spectacular thing. 
that is present in all of nature, in, in, in mammals and reptiles and anything that you know is animated. But they've got some. They've got this liquid called blood that the, that that their life is in, and science still can't figure it out. They try to, but you know they think they understand. They try to propose and they try to make out like they more than they uh, they know more than they do, but they don't. And and uh, um, he was sinless. And uh, we can't atone for our own sin because it doesn't measure up. And we know that Christ's blood did measure up because when he died, God rose him from the dead. Wouldn't have done that had not the sacrifice been adequate. That's tough to explain. It's, it's tough to understand, too. I mean, I've heard that story and I've lived around that thought and teaching all my life. And, and I'm still getting my head around it. And it still inspires wonder in me as well. I don't need it explained because I, I I walk in the in the benefit of it and in the power of it. And it's it's uh it's 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 wonderful. It really is, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Genesis 1 1. What name of God did Moses use when he wrote in Hebrew the first sentence of the book in Genesis? Okay. Let us make man in our image. Okay. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, okay? The Hebrew word is Elohim. And Elohim has always been recognized as the Hebrew word uh, for, that, that means the plural, it's the plural form of God. Where God is saying amongst his ruling council, amongst the gods that are with him, he's the most high God, but there are other gods that rule with him, okay? And are in partnership with him. Let us, let us, the gods, let us make man in our image. He does not say, I'm going to make man in my image. Okay? In our image. There's a lot implied there. And uh, um, uh, again, I refer to Michael Heiser, who's got some real, you know, really beautiful and fresh biblical insight on that, that I never heard preached, you know, in 62 years of being in the church. And it's, 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 re it's inspired me again. It's refreshed me with, you know, how powerful, you know, the Bible really is. It really is the Word of God. It's powerful stuff. Really good. Explain why it takes more faith to be an atheist than it takes to believe what the Bible says. Well, I, I boil it down to a simple equation that I give people, okay? And I've given this before. Many people have heard it before. If you are an atheist, if you are really an atheist, now most atheists don't think about it this way, but let me tell you what you are if you were an atheist. You believe that nothing plus nothing times blind chance plus 20 billion years equals everything. If you're an atheist, you believe that. Now, if you're responding by saying, well, no, I don't believe it. Yes, you do. Because you don't believe there's a God. You don't believe there's a creator. You believe that everything came together by chance. And if you wait long enough, you know, randomness creates order. That's never been proven. It can't be observed in nature, but that's what you believe. Now, if you want to believe that, you got way more faith than I do. Way more. Because I believe in an all-knowing God that's incredibly creative, that made this world within with Im this all of creation with amazing order and amazing intricacies. Tell me how life has been created. Life can you cannot create life. Okay? And any scientist that tries to tell you, we've created life in the laboratory. No, you haven't. You bored the life. You bought you bored the organic material from somewhere. God made life from nothing. Okay? And if you don't have organic, but if you don't have life already there, you cannot create life. Man cannot create life. Well, what about amino acids? Those are the building blocks of life. You call that life? That's like saying, and they say this, they say that's proof that man can create life, that you can get it from inorganic matter. You know what that's like saying? That's like saying we've created a brick. We create a brick so that's proof that the Empire State Building happened by random. Even though the Empire State Building has not only got bricks, but it's got glass, it's got concrete, it's got steel, it's got working elevators, it's got electricity, it's got plumbing. Now that's just the, that, just, just the, uh, uh, the Empire State Building. The creativity of God not only is, 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 is you know, uh, an amino acid, 
I'll tell you how far amino acids is from is from is from life. And not only a, like a brick to the Empire State Building, it's like believing that you know you can get the Empire State Building, and the Empire State Building gives birth to other Empire State Buildings, and those buildings are intelligent, all from a brick. Are you kidding me? And there are people who believe that, and they promote it as if you know we've created life in the lab. That is garbage. Man cannot create life. And it's been proven over and 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 over again. And if you want to be an atheist and you want to live in denial of the facts, and you know, you believe that we've got everything we see from nothing and from random chance and waiting billions of years, you got way more faith than I do. Way more. Way more. So that's what I mean when I say it takes more faith to be an atheist than it does to believe in God. Oh, yeah, man. And you probably run into, oh, yeah, you Christians, you believe in a talking snake, man. Oh, yeah? Well, you guys believe that that snake got there from nothing, and it just happened. What, was there magic dust? How did it get there in the main, in the, well, random chat? Yeah, never been done, okay? Well, mutations. Mutations are swallowed up. Mutations are, 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 are always negative, okay? And they are always swallowed up by the generations. That's why if you increase mutations, what happens? It kills the species. What, what masquerades as science in our schools is nothing but is nothing but propaganda crap. And when you put it to the test, it falls apart. <laughs> When you know the facts, you know, you, 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 you know, what the Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You know, it doesn't mince words, you know. Hits it right on the nail. Does creation demand that there must be a creator, if, if, even if we don't use the word creation? Um, yeah, yeah, it does. Creation demands that there has to be a creator. Things do not create themselves. You don't get random, you don't get order on a random. That's defying a proven law of physics, okay? Things go from order to disorder, okay? Unless there is a creator, unless there's an outside force that's putting things in order, okay? Doesn't happen in nature. Never been observed, okay? But they preach faith. Well, this is how it happened, you know? Because, it? you know, forget it. Anyway. Yes, Kirk, I know it's just you and me, buddy, but you know what? It's like we do this because all kinds of people tune in during the week, buddy, so we just stay at it, right? We invite people to tune in the intimate live and be a part of it, but you you know, you can't you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink, you know. What's even more profound, you can lead a horse to water, but if you can get him to float on his back, whoa, you really got something there. I like that quote better. Because it brings in the supernatural. Explain why the Big Bang was an impossible event. Well, because uh, an explosion never results in, in, in order. Okay? An explosion creates chaos. There's more chaos everywhere. W what would possess your mind to think that, you know, cells would come together and these cells would somehow get life and somehow that life would get more complicated and that life would evolve? That doesn't happen. Well, we see it in it. No, you don't see it in nature. Nature. What you see in nature is change. Nature is changes in population. Okay. What you see in nature is creatures that were created very well that they're able to adapt to certain circumstances. That's not evolution at all. It's adaptation. Big difference. One is evidence of uh, greater creation. The other is a, is a, is a, is speculative nonsense. Okay. You don't get order from chaos. That's why the Big Bang thing is a joke, okay? The Big Bang is, is a fool's hopeless answer to creation. That's his hopeless explanation, which falls apart all over the place when you've got honest scientific scrutiny and not stupid scientific, not stupid religious dogma, because that's what atheism is. Atheism is religious dogma. That is not founded on science. It's founded on stupid, unprovable, impossible theory. Thank you very much.
We could read about the Garden of Eden and everything that was in the Garden, but Scripture doesn't describe anything outside of the Garden. Tell us what Adam and Eve may have seen once they were put out of the Garden. Um, well, the only answer I can give you is what was outside of the Garden wasn't a Garden. What did that look like? I don't know. Fields? Wilderness? Mountains? Rocks? Desert? We know the difference between a garden and a non-garden. When they got kicked out, it was a non-garden. I, I know that's not a very good answer, but that's all the Bible gives us. The Bible tells us everything we need to know. It doesn't always tell us what we want to know. And, oh, I could keep you here all night on stuff I'd want to know. In fact, I remember, oh, in, 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 in the thousands of shows that I did, I remember a number of times we would have people call in, you know, give us things you'd like to know, you know? What's some of the info that we don't know that you'd love to know? Oh, man, we had uh, probably had a good half dozen radio shows where people called in and just, you know, we had fun with that. Those were fun shows. And we did those on non-Ask the Pastor Nights. Now, we could do them on Ask the Pastor Nights because you'd give the faith aspect to it. But, man, I mean, go to the moon with that. It's all speculation. There's no biblical evidence that tells us what was outside the garden. It was a non-garden, I guess. Does everyone that confesses Christ possess Christ? Um, no. No, because uh, uh, Matthew 7.22, uh, you know, uh, you know, Lord, Lord, when did we see you naked? When did we see you, you know, uh, uh, in prison? When did we see you hungry? When you've done the least of these, you've done it unto me. Depart from me. I never knew you. So there's people that confess Christ, you know? It's not whether you know Jesus, it's whether he knows you. And that's why 1 John 1, 9 says, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, okay? And you will be saved. God is the one who discerns the heart. He's the one that can tell whether people really believe in him or not, or they're just putting on a charade, you know? And maybe that's why Jesus said, you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. The heart is deceptive of all things. The heart will deceive you. And... um. I see the wisdom in Jesus saying that. You'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. It's not just, oh yeah, I believe in God. Well, the devil believes in God. In fact, I would suggest that the devil has more faith in God than most people, you know, walk in the face of the earth right now. He doesn't serve God, doesn't follow God, but he knows he exists. He believes in him. It takes way more than just belief in him. Okay? Believe in your heart and confess your mouth is that Jesus Christ that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and you will be saved. He's the one that makes the call on whether that belief is real or not. I think, he, And I think we can see evidence of it, because the Bible says, by your fruits you'll know them, you know, but he's the one that makes the call. Did Christ die for us, or God, did Christ die for us, or did God the Father, or God the Father, did he die for us, or did Christ die for God the Father? No, he died for us. The father was doing quite well before, you know, the son, you know, before the uh, mankind screwed up. And he would have been fine, even without mankind. Nobody had to die for God, okay? But God so loved us that he died for us, that we would be in a relationship with the father, you know? A lot to that. Why was the archangel Michael mentioned by name? I have no idea. There's only two angels that are named in the Bible, Michael and Gabriel. Now, in the book of Enoch, Enoch lists all kinds of names. Oh, boy, he lists all the bad ones, lists all the good ones, and there's a number of them, okay? But um, Enoch is a very good book, very respected, and, you know, Enoch may even be right, but Enoch's not the word of God. I, I, I really enjoy the book of Enoch. I think I, you know, believe most of the stuff that's in there, but I don't believe it to the level that I would stake my life on it like I would stake my life on the Word of God, okay? I don't think it's heretical. I don't think the book of Enoch leads you astray. It's just not on the same level as the Bible, okay? And the Bible just names two angels. That's all. Michael and Gabriel. Well, Lucifer, too, if you want a fallen angel, you know? Was mankind God's only attempt to make a people of his own? According to the Bible, yes. Yes. Um, 
Psalm 19 and 1 says the heavens declare the glory of God. Who's out there declaring the glory of God? Is that, you know, the wonder of his creation shows the evidence that, you know, God should be glorified? Or are there actual beings out there in the heavens that declare the glory of God? We don't know. Sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We have no evidence that he did that for anybody else. If he did, he may have. There's just no evidence of it. We take great care of our earthly living bodies. We feed them, clothe them, and wash them. How will we care for our heavenly bodies? I don't have a clue. 1 Corinthians 13 says, Eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard what God has in store for those who love him. I think it's beyond our imagination. I mean, if they're heavenly bodies, I would think that they require less care because they're more powerful. They're going to live forever. Um, you know, based on what we do know, I think we can have some healthy speculation. Um, I don't think health is going to be an issue at all. I think that we're going to we're going to have perfect health, and it would be almost impossible to destroy them because they're going to live forever. You know, like that'd be a fun thing to talk about, wouldn't it? You know, one on one. Were our spirits and souls meant to exist in physical bodies? Or can they exist without a physical body? Well, yeah, they can exist without a physical body, okay? Because the, to be absent from the body is to be spirit is to be present with the Lord. So there, there is some type of physical existence outside of our body, but our spirits were intended; they were meant to exist in a body. Okay, we shall be like Him. Jesus was like us. Jesus came and dwelt amongst us. He had a body. Um, did He have a body before He was born? Yeah, some type of body. He wasn't just a spirit. He was physical, okay? And he took on uh, the form of a fetus. Think about that. Almighty God spent nine months inside a Hebrew teenager's womb. And he was a baby. He was one. He was two. He was four. You know, he was eight. Tooled around Nazareth, you know, on his little tricycle or whatever toys they had back then. Fully God, fully man. That's, that's quite a... You know, but we were meant to exist in a body. Yeah. That's why Jesus died, not just for our sins, but he died to redeem our bodies. He died a physical death and he was raised physically to drive home the point that we are eternal beings with a body, which is in direct opposition to some of the, you know, to Hinduism and Buddhism, for instance, you know, for instance, you know, which, you know, teaches that we're going to become one with one great you know, uh, Nirvana mind, which is, man, it, it, that would motivate me to leave the religion because if, if, if my eternal state is going to be part of one big cosmic blob, I'm going to lose all my individuality. Where's the fun in that? Come on. You know, <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> no, no. <nah. laughs> I would leave the religion right away. You know, you get to the bottom of that. Why would I want that? You know, forget it. Are you kidding me? I, I'm gonna follow a religion where we're, we're you know, the, a, a, a cow craps on the on the on the road, and and extreme Hindus, you know, they fight over the dung, you know, because they consider cows holy. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'm gonna believe that the Son of God loves me, and and I'm gonna live and reign with Him forever, in a in a spectacular sin free world that is beyond our imagination. As far as excitement, joy, and fun, and pleasure, like you, you can't even imagine. Are there any redeemable qualities of the human body? Um, um, I don't know if I understand your question. Are there any redeemable qualities of the human body? I, I, I don't know. I love my wife's body, I, you know, I, I love her, I, I love my kids, I love playing with them, you know, I love, you know, like, my grandkids, and, um, I probably not understand the question. That's my fault, Kirk, not yours. Maybe we'll re retool that in uh, 
And if I'm not answering it properly, or it's not the answer you're looking for, that we can uh, you can rejig that one. I know you've done that in the past and done a great job with it. So I have great faith in you, buddy. Why were Hebrews forbidden to cremate their dead? Out of respect for the body, this whole discussion we're having. The, the Bible's very respectful of our body. You know, like you got the pagans who run after, uh, you know, like uh, false gods like Ashtoreth and Baal and uh, uh, Molech. And, you know, it, it was quite common for them to cut their bodies up. That that wasn't going to happen in God's economy. No way. Because he's, he, he knows that like a, a thousand years after that's happening, he's going to take on human form and he's going to die for our bodies, not just our souls. The body's a very holy thing in, in, in Christianity and in, and in Judaism as well. Okay, there's great respect. And uh, I think one of the reasons there's great respect is because when you go back to the creation story, he creates all of creation, says it's good. When he creates man and woman, he says it's very good. There's a distinguishing there. And uh, it's out of respect for the body that, that God declared to be very good. It's not just a, you know, a, a, an old garment that we wear out. It describes it as an old garment that we wear out. but we're going to be given a new garment that's going to live forever. Why? Because the body's important to God. He wants it very. He wants the, the the message to be driven home. This isn't just a head trip Nirvana type, you know, uh, spiritual experience that's out of the body. No, heaven is real. Jesus is real. Jesus physically rose from the dead. Jesus will return in physical form. The Bible says we will be caught up. Those of us that are still alive that know Him will be caught up to meet Him in the air. Okay. And uh, it's violating um, in, uh, orthodox interpretation to, to think that's just a spiritual thing. It's physical. It's real. This is real. God invaded history. God took on human form. The creator of all things is interacting with his creation in a physical, real way. The miracles that Jesus did were real. Okay? His bodily resurrection was real. In fact, Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 15. If it's not real, then let's shut this whole thing down right now. If it's not real, then our preaching is useless and your faith is worthless. The whole Christian faith hinges on the bodily resurrection of Christ. Okay? And that's why, you know, we don't cremate. No, yeah, I mean, th there are saints that have been burned at the stake, you know, that God's going to resurrect their body. He's going to put together some type of body where they, it's it's going to be animated and just as powerful as, you know, more powerful than the body they had before they were totally destroyed. You know, bodies that are buried at sea, you know, and they decay and they just disappear and they degrade. You come back to a body, 150 years it's been exposed to underwater. You can't even find a trace of it. The skeleton's even gone. Are those under the new covenant Forbidden to cremate the dead. Well, I've just given you a case of why uh, cremation is not a biblical thing, but there's no biblical evidence to suggest that cremation is a sin. You know, I know why Christians don't cremate, although, um, um, you know, it, it, they seem to be cremating more and more, especially because with the cost of, uh, of uh, burial and caskets being so much more through the roof than a simple cre cremation. You know, I understand, I mean, but there's nothing in the Bible that says it's a sin. There's nothing in the Bible that says that if you cremate the body, you're going to hell or anything. No way. That's not there. What's our time link? Oh, this might be the last question here. Let's see. Please explain 2 Corinthians 5, 3 to 4, and 1 to 5. Okay, so let's, I don't, okay, I've got really one to five here encompasses three to four so maybe i got it written wrong anyway so here it comes and i'm supposed to explain it and what's going on here so we'll do our best here here it comes for we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed we have a building from god an eternal house in heaven not built with human hands so he's comparing our earthly body with our heavenly body which we're, which is going to live forever and this earthly body is like a tent compared to the body we're going to have that's going to live forever. And it's not built with human hands. My body, my uh, uh, with God, my parents co-created this body. I mean, the miracle, the, the, the miracle power that God gave mankind that we're able to reproduce, we literally can create life. God gave us that life and, and men 
procreate, okay? So I am made with human hands, a male and a female. Well, the body that I'm going to have for all of eternity is not one that was made just with human hands, okay? So that's what verse 1 means. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Yeah, there's uh, like, uh, I got to get my hips replaced, okay? Bodies break down. Um, bodies get hungry. Bodies get tired. Bodies need care. And, and it's kind of like a spiritual groaning. You know, there's coming a day when I don't have to worry about what I eat anymore. There's coming a day when I'll be able to, you know, uh, 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 <laughs> do super powered things, okay? And, and we were created for that. We aspire to that because God put it within us to, you know, to be united with him and to have that body. Verse 3, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. Well, yeah, compared to that eternal body, it's like we're naked now. We've got no, no power whatsoever compared to that body. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. So much greater, so much more powerful. We feel weak. You know, something inside us says, you know, why do I have to strive like this? We aspire to something more. Uh, Blaise Pascal said it better than anybody. There's a God-shaped vacuum in all of us that only God can fill. Okay, and it's a it's not just a spiritual thing, it's a physical thing too. And and Paul is eloquently describing the physical side of it here. Verse 5. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. In other words, when you come to Christ, his spirit is the agent of salvation. He comes in. And you become spiritually aware. There's more to it than this. There's more to it than just working and having a paycheck. There's more to it than just going through a 24-hour day and trying to eke out a living. There's more to it than this. What is that? That's the Holy Spirit that tells us something's coming. It's going to be great. Something tell, something's coming that's going to be more pleasurable, more fun, That where the burdens will be lifted. Every tear will be wiped away, and we will live and reign in paradise with God forever. Hmm. I told you, comment sections take precedent over questions. Even if Kirk, our show producer, is the guy that put it out, and he just asked, how did your hip appointment go yesterday? My hip appointment. My uh, uh, hip replacement, I got to get them both replaced. The first one, uh, I got bumped up in priority. Okay, the, the, the surgeon deemed that my case was more serious than typical. And uh, so it looks like June. June is when I'm going to be getting uh, the first one replaced. And uh, I would say it went very, very well. Very, very thankful. And I'm also on the cancellation list. So it's possible. It's possible I could get them replaced tomorrow. There could be a cancellation. I could be called in. Okay. And uh, 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 I am scheduled to go to uh, Saskatchewan and California to uh, see my grandkids, my two brand new grandsons, one in Saskatoon and one in Los Angeles. And uh, man, I'm living for that and looking forward to that more than anything else in my life right now. And I'm trusting that whatever happens with my hips, like a cancellation or whatever, does not conflict with that. But God's got that all under control. And uh, all things, all things work together for good to them that love God, they're called according to his purpose. And uh, Kirk, thanks for asking. I'm just, that, that's been a real source of victory. I'm very, really excited for how things are going. And uh, um, I mean, I'm in pain all the time and the pain is increasing, but it's easier to handle pain when you know a cure is coming. Okay. And uh, hip replacements are so common now that uh, um, they give odds of like 99 to 99.5%, 100% cure of all the pain when you get them done. And uh, I'm, I'm really, really thankful. I live in a country and I live in a, a place where, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's a blessing from God that I can, you know, experience healing this way. Now, I've had at least 20, 30 people pray for me, lay hands on me, pray for me, make the pain, you know, ask for healing. That's great. You know, God wants to heal me quicker and in a more supernatural way, that'd be way more fun, wouldn't it? You know, but I'm the type of guy that I will take healing any way I can get it. And to me, getting my hips replaced, if, if it comes to a certain... That to me, that's just as much of a miracle of God and something to be thankful for as, you know, God did it supernaturally. Hey, hey look at my body didn't belong to me anyway. It belongs to my wife and it belongs to God. God first, then my wife. And uh, for me to take ownership, yeah, I got to take care of it. And, and, you know, I'm doing my best to do that. But uh, pretty thankful for uh, how everything's transpiring. 
We're doing our prayer meeting and Bible study tomorrow night at 315 Lisker at the Bible House, 7 o'clock. Open to everybody. Come and join us. Thursday night's party night. We serve free soup to all of our street friends and have a great time at the Bible House, 315. That We start serving at 630 on Thursday night. And Sunday is, uh, it kind of resembles church, okay? It's not like any church probably you've ever been to. It's kind of raucous and kind of wild, but man, we love it. And and you know what? Uh, I think I probably speak for people that come on Sunday. Uh, once you've tasted the way we do church, I'm sorry, I'd be bored to tears. I'm bored to tears in the end of the church. I am. I really am. Okay. And it doesn't mean that ours is better. It's just that God's there and it's, it's pretty cool. Okay. And that's at Peace Tower Church. And uh, Sunday's at three o'clock. And uh, of course, and of course, we broadcast live. If you want to see what our church service is like, it's not very impressive when you see it on screen. Um, but I don't know, you might love it. Um, it's pretty low tech too, the broadcast. And uh, it, it, we go live around 630 ish. Okay. Right here at the Facebook page, we go live. If you want to see the church service or come live and see us at Bronson at uh, 3, 343 Bronson, the Peace Tower Church. Otherwise, let's pray. End of the broadcast. Jesus, thank you for another great night. Thank you for my brother, Kirk, Lord God. Lord, I pray that, Lord, everything we've said and done tonight, Lord God, would be a blessing to people that tune in during the week. And God, I'm going to push it a little further. God, I pray you'd give us a, a greater live audience just for the sake, God, of uh, people interacting. God, it's so fun to interact with people here and and uh, put comments up, and we're able to respond. Have your way, though, Lord God. Have your way. This is your thing, God, and you're going to do with it what you want it, Lord, because we belong to you, and your ways and your thoughts are always higher and better. Thank you for tonight, God. In Jesus' name, amen. See you in church, kids. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks.